Hi, I'm Lindsay Knight. I'm the Chief Impact Officer of Blue Star Families. I'm genuinely thrilled to see all of you here. Uh, there we go. Thanks, tech team. Um, I am filling in for Dr. Jessica Strong, who unfortunately came down with COVID. Uh, she's a valued member of our team. She is much missed here today. Uh, and I also wanted to call out that the full 80-page research report uh, in the folders that you have, there's a, a little two-sheeter. On the back, there's a QR code there for any of the potential data geeks in the room. Um, please give that a scan, and you can read the entire report that has been written by our applied research team uh, in partnership with IVMF. Um, and thanks to all of the folks in the room uh, who are representing the research community on that front. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, one of the reasons that I came to Blue Star Families, and CT knows this, uh, is frankly the work that she was leading here with the campaign for the campaign for inclusion and the research that we're doing on this front. Everybody has a how did Kathy get to them story. Uh, she was my first interview with Blue Star Families, and as everyone here knows, it's very hard to say no to. Um, and really, the work, oh, wait, can you not hear the, oh, sorry. Um, the work that we're doing with the Campaign for Inclusion is not only part of our research team, and it's not only an initiative that we are running in partnership with so many MSOs and VSOs and government institutions, but it is a part of every single program and every single piece of research that Blue Star Families does. It is truly that unifying thread in our why, um, and I just wanted to present that vision before we dig into the data. So, a bit of background. Uh, as we have all heard, this work started in 2020 uh, in the wake of George, George Floyd's murder, and the research from that year came out in 2022. Our biggest finding from that year was that one-third of military families of color consider racism, discrimination, and safety, and I want you to all keep safety in your minds as we go through these statistics from this year, but safety in the local community when making decisions about duty stations and even staying in the service. The following year, what we wanted to then dive into, there we go, for 2023, is what are those elements within communities around discrimination that cause those individuals to not want to be deployed to certain locations, um, to take different orders, to turn down orders, or frankly, to leave the service entirely. So in 2023's research, uh, we did find that those families who experience discrimination in their community are significantly less likely to feel a sense of belonging or recommend their communities to other families like theirs or frankly to recommend military service at all. In the details that we're going to get to with this year's study, I know there are not that there are skeptics in the room here today, but there are skeptics in the rest of the world that are going to look at our statistics and say our findings and say, those are nice to haves, that's great, um, but that's not a priority for my budget, my community, my organization, my constituency, et cetera. Uh, and that's just false. Belonging and safety and trust and community and making sure that all of our military families feel like they are valued and seen in the civilian communities that they call home is a national security issue. And if we want to retain, recruit, and maintain the best all-volunteer force that we can, this has to be a priority that is shared across sectors and it is shared across the political spectrum. So all of that undergirded what we wanted to do in 2024. It's three goals. One, to understand whether representation at the community level is associated with the sense of belonging for diverse uh, military families. Two, to understand the strategies and resources that those uh, families are using to develop community connections. And three, to identify solutions so that communities can put this into action to create a deeper sense of belonging for the families that, um, that call those communities home. So a little bit of background, because we're here for a data dive, aren't we? Um, what's our methodology and where did we start from? It's a mixed methods approach this year. Uh, we started out with our um, uh, MFLS, our Annual Military Family Lifestyle Survey. Uh, for those of you in the room, you maybe went to our data dive on that earlier this spring. This is 2.0. Uh, we had around 3,500 respondents to MFLS uh, for 2023. What we then did with that survey was drill down by zip code or geography, those folks who were living in those three communities that CT called out earlier, and then we sent additional um, uh, survey questions and information to them, and then in a, a couple instances also did in-depth comparative interviews. Uh, so you'll see here, uh, 
focus was three communities. We had over 500 respondents across each of those communities, over 1,800 qualitative responses. Uh, and that is the information and data that is informing uh, these results. But it is grounded in our broader MFLS research. So it, there, it's not standalone. It is very much connected to those findings. Featured communities, we already went over this. But to tell you or give a little bit more of a drill down as to why these three were featured, one, geographic diversity, two, um, uh, diversity of populations and demographics, and also to make sure all of the armed services, uh, or as many as possible, were represented. So you'll see some big cities, some small cities, some really homogenous civilian communities that folks are based in, some that are a snapshot of all of America. Uh, so we really wanted the, a, a comparative point to see what's working, what's not, and be able to share that out and, and draw broader conclusions. Our findings. Um, unsurprisingly, although good news, as Kathy put in the letter to, to you all in that, um, in that folder, belonging is critical for military family resilience and well-being. And as, again, I'm not sure anyone here is surprised by, it is harder for diverse military families who don't necessarily see themselves reflected or represented in those communities to feel that sense of belonging. And as we stated at the beginning of this, that need to be seen, valued, um, and trusted or have access to trusted support networks is so incredibly important to maintaining the resilience of our military families and also maintaining um, the, the viability of the all-volunteer force. So um, this is just going to look like a bunch of statistical jargon, and it's a really boring slide. And one of the methodologies um, that we used in approaching not only the survey construction, but the type of questions that we asked, and also the, uh, the way we wanted to represent data, is that everyone has has a network of different identities. Not one of us is one thing. We are drawn to different affinity groups. We um, uh, have different uh, faith affiliations. Uh, we are of different races. So we can't look at this as it's a one size fits all. Every, everyone wants the same thing. You can't make those conclusions even for one racial group in a single like physical geographic area. Diversity matters, and diversity matters even within demographics. So what, uh, this is a slide that's also on the handout, because I thought it was one of the really key takeaways here, is that, first of all, and I know we have a lot of good news to share, but this is the first point is actually uh, less good news. Um, a quarter of respondents, regardless of identity, don't feel welcome in their communities. That is an opportunity. We can solve for that, but we need to figure out what would make them feel welcome. Second point. Um, Everybody kind of wants something else, and it's a puzzle piece to be put together. So this is a long-term, committed, multifaceted solution that communities need to get behind, and multiple groups in multiple communities get to, need to get behind. So it's not, it's not a box-checking exercise. It is very much a how do we create a community that is reflective of all of the folks who are living there. So I'm not going to go through line by line, but please don't just scan over it or do the glazed eyes. This one matters, even though, you know, it's, it's just percentages. So uh, in the full report, you will also see uh, we found nine different factors that are associated with a strong sense of belonging. The top three are being valued, being understood, um, and having something in common with others in that community. We're going to focus a little bit next in what it matters to have in common, because it varies by person, it varies by family, and it varies by community. This is one of our most interesting findings. We all know identity is multifaceted, um, as we've heard from multiple, multiple perspectives on the stage here today. And this order, uh, these six on this page, were not the universal answer for everyone who took our survey, but they are the top six of all of the respondents. And if you will see, military and veteran affiliation was actually number two, and it beat out a whole lot of other different identities. Um, so one, one approach or solution to this is if you are seeking to make a space of belonging for military-connected or military-connected families in diverse communities, focusing on that identity as the thing that is shared in common is a way to get to all of the other pieces and start building those support networks of trust. Um, and again, obviously, this ranked order varies by individual, but the fact that number two is their military and veteran affiliation, I think, is a really, really important takeaway. 
This is another one that I find fascinating. Unsurprisingly, although isn't it great to have data to go with those hunches or anecdotes, um, cultural access and opportunities to participate in communities where people can see their cultures represented and represented appropriately is incredibly key. So this is broken down by the three communities we have here. So between Hill Air Force Base, San Antonio, and Hampton Roads. Um, we'll get into the demographics a little bit further on how these communities differ, but Across respondents, you will see that particularly at Hill, um, white respondents did say that they uh, had more opportunities part to participate in a culture that represented them than respondents of color or those from the LGBTQ communities. Um, similarly for San Antonio, Texas, uh, but then we get to Hampton Roads and they're doing, we'll discover why in a bit, but they're, they're doing some interesting things and it's the fact that they have been doing them and committed to them formally for a really long time. Uh, but that, that is reflected in their numbers here. So let's get to those community findings. Uh, well, actually, before I go to that one, we'll do a little bit more background on, on Hill here. Um, so we picked Hill, uh, one, because we have very strong community ties there. Uh, we uh, adore base representation there. And we have a chapter in Utah. Uh, but uh, Hill Air Force Base has uh, been a partner of ours for a while. Uh, Colonel Holland is going to be speaking to some of the work that they have been doing there uh, for a number of years with, with Project One. But we picked it because it's a smaller community in a western state. It's in a fairly um, uh, homogenous racial community and also homogenous religious community. So just to give a little bit of statistics here, um, Davis County, where Hill Air Force Base is located, is 91% white and 71% affiliated with the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, otherwise known as the Mormon community. So it's, it's a unique environment demographically, and the folks who are coming to Hill are not reflective of the broader community that, uh, that they're being found in. Um, from this particular study, we had 226 respondents and 800 open-ended responses from those individuals. So I'm going to let every, everyone can read the individual bullet points, but the one that I really want to pull out here, because we started talking about belonging, community representation, and safety, 79% of respondents of color feel safe in the communities they live, compared to 92% of the white and LGBTQIA respondents in this community. Kathy spoke about the social hierarchy of needs earlier. We need security and stability in order to gain prosperity and freedom. This finding should tell us that we have members who are serving our country and serving our communities that don't feel safe where they live, and it is a huge opportunity to improve that. It is also a massive difference between feeling a sense of belonging and feeling welcome and feeling like your family is safe when they go home. So I'm gonna let that one sink in for a little bit, but this is probably our strongest finding out of, out of the Hill community. Should never trust me with a PowerPoint clicker all. Um, so for best practices, uh, we have a panel coming up later, so I'm gonna just do a, sort of a, a gloss over on this. Colonel Holland's gonna speak a lot more in depth, but the respondent identified resources is just having community spaces, whether that's a farmer's market, third spaces, uh, affinity groups around shared interests, hiking clubs, family and, and uh, kid-friendly events, but things where you're actually creating community across demographic or military or veteran or civilian lines. Um, again, uh, Colonel Holland's gonna go into the Project One uh, initiative that he, has, uh, he and his team have been supporting there, but this is also a really unique institutional setting in that it's bringing together uh, military representation, a local and state government, uh, school systems from primary to secondary to colleges, and, and supporting military communities to get to the heart of the challenges uh, that they are experiencing in the, commun uh, the community surrounding Hill Air Force Base. San Antonio, Texas. It's a good one. I think we have some representation on our panel later from San Antonio as well. Um, so San Antonio, obviously very different uh, than the area near Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, it is military city, USA. Uh, it is a m large, uh, multicultural su southern city with a significant Hispanic and Latino population. Uh, the population here uh, identifies as 60% Hispanic or Latino, 9% black, 4% Asian, and 3% multiracial. Um, 
We had 154 participants for this and 550 open-ended responses. And again, I'm going to let everyone read the community perceptions, belonging, safety, and trust numbers. As you'll, as you'll see from the first one, the respondents of color and LGBTQ families responded essentially on par or within the, the same range as white families for uh, feeling a sense of belonging. But again, we have some outlier moments here. 60% of respondents of color trust their neighbors compared to 75% of white respondents and 71% of LGBTQ plus respondents. That needs to change. We also released, uh, did a, a smaller pulse check survey uh, earlier this spring around what civilian perceptions of military families was in terms of levels of trust. Military families are one of the most trusted institutions in the United States with a nine out of 10 civilian um, uh, respondents to this survey stating that they trusted military families. But we know in this community that only 60% of our respondents of color think that is true. So again, huge opportunity to build trust networks and support networks locally. And the recommendations we have for what will lead to feelings of uh, welcome or belonging help to get us there, but they are not the same thing. Again, we're going to hear more in depth um, from General Ayala on this, but what uh, San Antonio has done is really uh, leaned into public-private partnerships, uh, community and civilian involvement, stood up advisory boards, fellowships, opportunities, and incorporated and reached out to military families uh, across that city. And it has, it has shown dividends for it based on those belonging numbers and the fact that everyone is, is sort of on the same page about that. Uh, but again, I'm going to leave details to the panel. Community findings for Hampton Roads, also quite, uh, quite different. Um, so Hampton Roads, uh, uh, and uh, Brian, I'm going to leave, leave again the details to you during the panel. But what we see here is that uh, respondents of color and white respondents are essentially on the same page uh, about senses of belonging. We can improve it. 50% can always go up. But there's nothing particularly out of keeping in terms of demographic differences there. What is truly stand out about this one, though, is that 78% of LGBTQ family respondents said they felt a sense of belonging. Uh, we will, again, during the panel, get into a lot more detail. But one of the things to point out here is that that's not an accident. <laughs> this community has been focusing on LGBTQ outreach and standing up uh, centers and having resources for the past, uh, and Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, 35 years. Yeah, so the fact that that last number was that 78% felt like they belonged there happened because they've been told for over three decades that they do. So it's also just a really good example of what a community, community can do to make sure that, that it's a, uh, a sustained commitment and it matters to the people who call it home. Summary and recommendations. Offering culturally relevant opportunities and culturally relevant means something different to each demographic and each population that we, um, that we interviewed. Highlighting common ground to build bridges. The second most important identity outside of being married or being in a relationship with someone was military and veteran affiliation. That is a really significant basis to build from. Increasing diverse uh, military families' voice in the community welcoming them into school boards, uh, welcoming, welcoming them into standing institutions and organizations where they can not only have representation but participate themselves. And then the fourth one is listening to military families at the community level. As we saw, belonging is great. Welcome is great. Trust and safety are different. So when military families are experiencing things in the community, it's, the answer isn't always necessarily to have another cultural event. It is what is the problem and what is the appropriate solution to solve for those families' needs. Also, because we have to give a shout out because it's September and we're in a Blue Star Families event, you can host a Welcome Week event. Um, <laughs> So uh, we, we all know that over 600,000 families move every year. Every year we also welcome those families into their new communities. So if you are here and in a community that has a military family presence, which is, by the way, every zip code in the United States, um, please go on our website and find out how you can individually play a part. This is also linked in your, in your one-pager in your folder. Um, similarly, 
many of you work at organizations that hire people. Um, so uh, becoming a formal part of the Do Your Part campaign, uh, whether that is on the community and connectedness front, jobs and economic security, signing our 4 plus 1 commitment to make financial security and military spouse employment um, more robust across our country, or military and youth well-being and supporting that at the community level, please reach out. We would love to talk to anyone in this room individually about participating in either of these initiatives with Blue Star Families. Um, and I will close from there because that's the end of my slides. Thank you all for listening. Thank you.